if we look at public companies, how is a public company evaluated? Well, one of the evaluations is called the price earnings ratio. Isn't that right? So you say a company is worth this much per share because of its earnings per share. The earning ability of a company is what determines the value of the stock, determines the value of the company. When Apple is sailing, it becomes the most valuable company in the world. When Samsung comes out and cuts into their sales and Apple's sales level off, its earning ability levels off and the stock begins to decline. So one of the things you need to do is see yourself as a company and see yourself as a company with one person and with one share of stock. Now, if you were a company and you were evaluating yourself on the basis of your earning ability or you wanted to sell stock in your personal company to someone else, would you say that you should invest in this stock yourself? Because this is a growth stock. This is going up in value every single week and every month. This is developing new skills and capabilities. If it's earning this much, this my, if my company, me, is earning this much this year, next year it will be earning 50% more. Because the critical factor that determines the growth of stock prices is anticipated increases in earning ability. Isn't that right? So see yourself as a company and ask yourself, am I a growth stock? Would I sell myself to, to, to old people and children? Would I sell myself to a pension fund as being a really safe, solid investment that's going up in value all the time? Now, you don't go up in value accidentally. You go up in value deliberately in a competitive market. So how is it that companies increase their value? Well, mostly they increase it two things. One is R&D, research and development. They're constantly developing new products and services that compete well in our marketplace so they can sell more of them. The companies that are most successful are the ones that are constantly coming out with new and better products and services and they're jumping over their competition. Well, what is R&D personally? Personally, R&D is upgrading your skills, developing the one skill that you need at this time to move ahead and then the next skill and becoming a continual learner so you're constantly investing time and money in yourself in getting better and better to increase your earning ability. So a good question you always ask is, what one skill would help me to double my income faster than any other skill? And then you work on that. You now you can't learn everything, so just pick one thing at a time. We say be a sniper. You know what the, you know what the motto in sniper school is? One shot, one kill. One shot, one kill. That's how they teach snipers. They have it on television all the time. And you need to be the same thing. One shot, one kill. Warren Buffett was at a dinner party with Bill Gates and Bill Gates Sr. And they were talking together because Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett are good friends, have been for a long time. And Bill Gates' father, very, very successful businessman in Seattle. They were at a dinner party and the three of them were talking, chatting away. And somebody came up to them and asked them a question. And he said, excuse me, gentlemen, these are two of the five richest men in the world. Both started with nothing by the way, started at zero. Warren, Warren Buffett started with $2,000 that he earned by delivering newspapers when he was 14, 15, and 16. And is now, his company is worth $360 billion, and his company's made $24 billion last year. Not bad for a career. <laughs> so anyway, so they came up to him and they said, gentlemen, excuse me for interrupting you, but we've just been noticing you talking, and we had a question for you what would you say is the most important skill for success? And then all three turned to him and said the same words simultaneously. Focus. Focus is the most important requirement for success. With focus you can do anything and without focus you can do nothing. Focus is the key to success. And, but all three said it simultaneously without asking each other. Focus. And it's really interesting because I began teaching this concept back in the year 2000. I began a, a coaching and mentoring program that I called Focal Point, Focal Point Coaching. You know, the focal point is where if you hold a magnifying glass in a certain way, the, it'll have a focal point that burns and you can burn through things. Well, so I called it Focal Point. And I taught thousands of business owners and have still all over the world in multiple languages how they can look at each part of their business and focus on the one thing in each area that they can do right now that will have the greatest positive impact. Everything else they do has a lesser impact or no impact. And your ability to select the one thing that can have the greatest impact on your life at any time and focus, focus is the key to your success. 
That's why I'm so concerned about the, I call it the attraction of distraction. It is so disturbing because it guarantees failure in life. You actually become addicted to distraction and you can't stop it. You're just like a dope addict. You've got to have your distraction. And if you, have, if you, if you are addicted to distraction, you can't focus. And if you can't focus, you haven't got a chance against someone who can. And so therefore, it's a, I, I'm hitting this a little bit hard, but I want you to think about it because most people slip into this attraction of distraction and they, we're, not, we're not even aware of it. Many of you are a little bit surprised when I talk about it because you hadn't even really thought about it. You hadn't even really thought about how much time you spend during the day distracted. And the answer is about 80%. And the rest of the time, by the end of the day, you're too tired to do anything worthwhile, to do the really important things that have big potential consequences. So your earning ability is your most important quality. And your earning ability means developing one skill at a time that can help you the most to get the most important results that determine your success and your happiness. Now here's the great payoff is they say that happiness is the progressive realization of a worthy goal or ideal. When you actually feel yourself moving progressively toward achieving something that's important to you, you feel happy and your brain releases endorphins. Now endorphins are different from dopamines, but endorphins are nature's happy drug. They make you happy. Endorphins make you more creative. They make you calmer. They make you more personable. They make you more focused. And they, just, and they give you more energy. So people who have high levels of endorphins are very healthy. They sleep well. They're very personable. They're creative all the time. And you can actually develop a positive addiction to endorphins. And the way you do that is you work on things that are moving you toward your goals on a regular basis. And so every day you feel this forward progress, this forward momentum. Human beings are designed so that we're only happy when we feel effective, when we feel that we are accomplishing something, when we feel productive, when we feel valuable. There's the, the, one of the challenges we have with welfare in uh, any country that has it, but especially in the US, is people can very quickly get addicted to welfare, but by com becoming addicted to welfare and free money, they become angry, they develop feelings of inferiority, they become alcoholic, they, all the joy in life is gone when they're not doing something productive, when they're not contributing. The, the rule is that your self-esteem and self-confidence are largely determined by the degree to which you feel you are make, putting more in than you're getting back out. And it's a very simple concept, is you feel that you're actually contributing more than you're getting. If you're at a job and you feel that you're not contributing as much as they're paying you, you feel really angry. It, has a, it seems to have a, a, a deep negative effect on your personality. But when you feel that you're doing a great job, that you're really making a difference or a contribution, you feel wonderful about yourself. And the only way that you can achieve that is by having clear goals and then focus. Well, oh, wow. Uh, so uh, I began to study management when I got into business many years ago, and I've read 6,000 books. I've studied an average of three hours a day for 50 years. I hate to say it, 50 years. But about, about 150,000 hours. I've read every conceivable book I possibly could and articles, and I'm still reading and learning great stuff. Some of the best thinkers in the world are writing today in books and articles and talking about breakthroughs, the th some of the things we just talked about now. Thinking skills, thinking fast and slow, short and long-term thinking, and so on. Well, over the years, I've accumulated what I call the big seven, and these are the seven roles and goals or most important responsibilities of leaders. And they're the most important things in business. And so I want to just share the seven with you. And I was asked to give you a thousand percent formula, how to increase your income by 10 times. And I'll give you that as well. Plus finally, the one quality that is most important for success, which was just repeated in a study of 500 of the fastest growing companies in the world, and they analyzed the personality profiles of the heads of these companies. One of the companies grew 42,000% in the last three years. And it's a company that produces tablets for children to help them keep on track with their homework. And parents are buying them with both hands. And they, grow, they grew 42,000% in three years. Is that a good growth rate? Average company grew five, six, seven, eight hundred percent in three years. So the ones down in, in the lower, uh, levels of this survey, but the top companies were growing thousands and 10,000, 20,000% in, in, in a three-year period. 
Unbelievable. Anyway, what they, they found the quality that was most responsible for the success of the CEOs and top people in each of these businesses, and I'll give it to you in a second. Don't let me forget. That'll keep you in your seats. Um, so what I found was that there were seven critical responsibilities of leaders in businesses of any size. And these are like ingredients in a recipe for a fine dish. If you're missing any one of the ingredients, the dish can fail. As a matter of fact, if you miss any one of the ingredients, the business can fail, or at least can achieve at a far lower level than it's truly capable of. So let's begin. Number one is to set and achieve business goals. This is the most important thing that you do as a leader in your business and in your life is to set and achieve business goals. Everything is your ability to achieve goals. And so we have to start off with my favorite word is clarity. What exactly are the business goals that you want to achieve and how do you measure them and what is your deadline for achieving them? And it is amazing how many business people and entrepreneurs avoid this question because they're afraid that they may not achieve the goal to the degree to which they can measure it and on that deadline. So they don't even want to set the goal at all. The major reason I found when I began studying human success 35 years ago, the major reason people don't set goals is that they're afraid they may fail. And they don't like the feeling of failure, so they don't set them at all. And so instead of setting very clear goals and making plans to achieve them, they just work every day. And they sort of hope that everything will be fine. They just hope it'll be fine. But successful people set and achieve goals, and they know what their goals are, and every person in the business knows what their specific goals are, which contribute to achieving the goals of the company. And the number one word is clarity. Be absolutely clear about your goals, your sales goals, your income goals, your profitability goals, your profit margin goals, your growth goals, your customer uh, acquisition goals. Is be very clear about your goals and then make plans to achieve them. Which are, and a plan is merely a list of activities organized by sequence. What do you do first? What do you do second? What do you do third? And then set deadlines. When am I going to achieve this goal? Now don't worry about missing the deadline or failing at achieving the goal. Failure is far more common in business than success. But every single time you set a goal and a schedule and a plan and you fail at it, you learn something valuable that helps you to be more successful next time. Uh, when I, uh, in my earlier years, I had some military experience. Just leave it at that. And one of the things I learned was how to shoot a mortar. And I've always used this as an, al an analogy. And we learned about mortars, both how to shoot them and what to do if somebody was shooting mortars at you. And here's what we found, is that a mortar man, a really good mortar man, is almost like a sniper. They're very, very accurate. What they would do is they would see a cluster of enemy troops or a target, and it would be, let's say, 1,000 yards away. And a mortar tube, as you know, is at an angle. And you drop the uh, mortar shell down, and as it hits the bottom, it's, sh it's shot off. And so it goes up and comes down. And the angle of the tube determines the, where the mortar shell goes up or down, the distance it flies, and so on. So anyway, so what they would do is they would estimate that the target is about 1,000 yards away, or say 1,000 meters. And so they would adjust the gauge, there's a gauge on the side, to 1,200 meters. And then they would shoot, boom. And they watch to see where the shell came down. And then they would adjust the mortar shell back to 900 meters. And they'd fire again, boom and adjust the seat to where it came down, and then they would use those two points and adjust the mortar and fire again, and they could drop a mortar down a chimney of a house. They could drop a mortar on a, a foxhole. The third shot, the third mortar, would be as accurate, on pinpoint accuracy, like a sniper. So what we were taught is that if somebody shoots at you with a mortar and, then, and it goes over your head, you think, boy, that guy's a real dummy. No, start moving. Start moving, because the second one is going to come in in front of you, and the third one will be on your head. So you would literally, when the first one came in, which was off target, you would start moving and move fast, because they could go boom, 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 and within like, like 18 to 20 seconds, they could pinpoint you and drop the mortar on your head. Well, how, what does this mean in business? In business, it means what we do is we set a clear target, and we set a goal and a schedule, and then we shoot. And what happens is we overshoot, undershoot, we make mistakes. And then what do you do? You adjust. That's all. You just adjust. And you keep adjusting until finally you get to the point where, where, where it works. 
And so don't worry about making mistakes. There's nothing wrong with it because everybody does it. The main thing is to learn from the mistake and adjust. Take in information and adjust until you're much more accurate. Big companies have used measures, and very, very tight measures, and they measure everything and constantly adjust the measures until they are producing products of superb quality 100% of the time, and they're selling millions of their product. When the iPhone came out, it was dismissed by companies like BlackBerry and Nokia as a toy. Nobody would ever buy it. It's a toy. It's for kids to play with and you know, communicate with their friends. So, uh, of course, those two companies are now gone. Um, great tragedy. Not really. Um, <laughs> but the point is, they experimented dramatically. They experimented hundreds of times to get the phone. And once they released the phone, it was virtually perfect. Sold 50 million sets the first year. Totally upended the entire world of telephones. Put the major telephone companies out of business within five years. Unbelievable. And then they brought out the iPad. Within a year of bringing out the iPad, one of the biggest bookstore chains in the world went bankrupt because people who bought iPads they, they immediately bought an average of 11 books. And they stopped going to bookstores. They could download the book in a matter of seconds at half price, and they stopped going to bookstores. And the book industry today, which I'm very involved in, is in desperation because nobody's buying books. And if they do buy books because of the power of distraction, they don't read them. Most people in this room haven't read a book from cover to cover in a long time. You may have bought the books. You may even have them on your iPads or, uh, or as e-books. You may have them at home, but you don't read them. They're sort of like decorations. And you say, well, have you read that book? Yeah, I got it at home. <laughs> That's true? Come on, come on. Why? Because you're so distracted. At the end of the day, you're, you're dumb. You've lost 10 IQ points, and you're exhausted. You can't read books. The weekend comes. You've got to read them. Anyway. So setting and achieve business goals. So what are your goals? And remember, clarity is the first word. Be absolutely clear about your goals and make sure that each person who works in your company is clear about their goals as well and how they will be measured, the number that you'll attach to them, and the schedule or deadline for achieving the goals. And then constantly make adjustments. The second key is, is marketing and innovation. Now, if I were to ask you, what is the purpose of a business? This is the great question. The answer is not to make a profit. The answer is to create and keep a customer. It's to get a customer and then hold on to the customer. And a profit is the result of doing that in a cost-effective way. So we say the purpose of a business is to create customers. That's why I said earlier, is if you're concerned with your revenues and your profitability, create more customers. How do you create more customers? You innovate. So marketing and innovation are the heartbeat. Kaboom, 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 kaboom of a business. Marketing means you're constantly contacting new prospective customers. And innovation means you're constantly improving the process of not only marketing, but of your products and services. So here's the second question. What is the measure of business success? What is the true measure, single measure of business success? The answer is customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction. Every person in every major company that is successful has a single focus, is they focus on marketing and improving their marketing and their products simultaneously, and then they focus on customer satisfaction. The rule is this, make customers happy. Make customers happy. By the way, it's something that I, I love to teach to my friends, is do you want to be rich in business? Well, there's a person out there who will make you rich. It's like a genie in a, in a cave, and the person is your customer. And you know how your customer will make you rich? Is you go to your customer and say, what can we do to make you happier than our competitors? What can we do to make you happier next time? And your customers will tell you, you'll do more of this or less of that, or if you'll start this or stop that, I'd be happier. And then you say, OK, we'll do that. And your customer will be happier, and they'll buy from you. They'll be more satisfied, and they'll be much happier. And they'll become loyal customers. So what I say is your customers will make you rich if you have the courage to go and ask them, what can we do to make you happy? What can we do to make you happier? What can we do to make you even happier? And the way you, the way you do customer research is you don't say, how's everything going? Because if you say, how is everything going? There's, there's this 22 years of research on this, by the way. I know so much good stuff. But basically, if you say, how's it going, they'll say, fine. And if a person says, fine, and say, makes no other comment, they're already talking to your competitor and planning to leave you. If they say fine and no, have no other comment, you've lost that customer. So instead of saying, how is everything going, 
you say, how could we serve you better in the future? How could we serve you better in the future? And they, and they will tell you, and everything they tell you is what they're unhappy about today with your, with your services. Here's an interesting point. Every company that is a big success today started off as a failure. They started off with products and services that were not particularly good. And then they got feedback from their customers and they constantly improved them until they were recognized as being excellent in their market. You, don't have, you do not have to be the best with your product or service. You just have to be in the top 10%. Now here's an aside with regard to marketing. And this is one of the, probably the most important work ever done at Harvard, 50 years of research on marketing and competitive advantage. And the expression is unique added value. This comes from Michael Porter's work. Unique added value means that people buy your product or service because they perceive that you offer unique added value. Now the word unique in any language is a special word. It's a word that cannot be qualified. That means it cannot be uniquer or more unique or less unique or uniquest. <laughs> there, you cannot qualify. There's, unique is one and only. So the key to business success is for you to offer unique added value. Is you offer something that the customer wants. Remember we talked about value creation? At what the customer wants and needs and values and is willing to pay for and that none, no other competitor can offer. And I'll give you a very simple example. One of the richest men in the world is a man named Tom Monahan. And he was a struggling student, an orphan, working, delivering pizzas for a small pizza restaurant when he was 20 years old. And he was attending courses at the local university in East Lansing, Michigan. And whenever he delivered pizzas, which he did in the evenings, it would take 60 to 90 minutes from the time the pizza was ordered to the time they were able to deliver it. And whenever he delivered pizzas, instead of people, especially students, being grateful, they were angry. Why does it take so long to get a pizza? And they kept asking him that, and they would throw tips at him, and they, they were just abusive. They weren't appreciative at all. And so he came up with an insight. And the insight is that when people order a pizza, they're already hungry. They don't order a pizza thinking, well, I'll be hungry in an hour when it gets here. When they order the pizza, they're already hungry. And you know what you're like when you're hungry. Well, that's how they're like. And there's, there's two or three of them, and they order the pizza, and they're all sitting there, and they're hungry. And when the person finally shows up, they're, they're angry. So he said, speed is more important than quality. And so he developed the concept. I could spend time teaching you. But basically, we'll deliver your pizza within 30 minutes or no charge. And he put up signs all over this university, which had 22,000 students. He bought a bankrupt pizza restaurant, sold his Volkswagen for the initial funds, got some, his brother and some other kids to work with him, and they reduced their number of pizzas to eight pizzas that they could pre-prepare of medium size. That's all. So that's all you could order was a medium-sized pizza, one of these eight kinds. And they pre-prepared the pizzas, so when the order came in, they put it in the oven, 12 minutes, cut it up. In 15 minutes after the order came in, the pizza was handed to the delivery boy, and they delivered it within a five-mile or five-kilometer radius. That was the beginning of what is called Domino's Pizza. Familiar with Domino's Pizza? There's more than 8,000 Domino's Pizza worldwide. Tom Monahan, a long time ago, sold his interest in Domino's for $1.8 billion. He's one of the richest men in the world because he came up with one simple, unique added value. The pizza may not be great pizza, pre-prepared, sometimes pre-frozen, but it's fast. And no other pizza company from that day to this in the world has ever tried to offer pizza delivery in 30 minutes. And so with Domino's, came one of the richest men in the world with one unique added value. Now sometimes the unique added value is yourself, is you are a special person with special talents, you have a great personality, you're very customer sensitive, you have lots of experience in this area, so you can really do a wonderful job for your customer. So sometimes it's just something as simple as you, as being the unique added value that no other company in the world has. But you've got to have one. And the rule is if you don't have one, you must develop it. You must figure out what do you have to have that then people say, why do they buy from you? They buy from you because you offer this and no other competitor can offer this. Really important. So the third question is, what is the mark of customer satisfaction? What's the measure of customer satisfaction? Repeat business. Repeat business is the mark of customer satisfaction. 
And the most, the highest level of customer satisfaction is customer recommendations and referrals to new customers. The most successful companies have take such good care of their, their customers that their customers buy from them and buy again and again and bring their friends. And so your job, this is your focus in building your ideal business. What do we have to do to first of all create customers, unique added value? What do we have to do to please our customers, to make them really happy so that they come back? And what do we have to do to get our customers to buy from us again? In our, in our two-day MBA, by the way, we go into depth at every single one of these and it literally transforms a business, transforms the whole thinking of everybody in the business and every customer contact. So, so the first of the seven keys, number one is set and achieve business goals. The second is to market and innovate. And innovating means finding faster, better, cheaper ways to make customers happy. Number three is to solve problems and make decisions. Now, I sometimes joke and I say, I have looked and I've memorized the job descriptions of everyone in this room before I came. I have a list of all of your names and your job descriptions. And I know what everybody here does for a living. And everybody, of course, is very skeptical. And I'll say, I'll tell you what it is, is that your job description, you ma'am, you are problem solver. And you, sir, you're a problem solver. And you are chief problem solver. And you're assistant problem solver. And you're, you know, junior problem solver. But all we do all day long is solve problems and make decisions. If there were not problems to be solved and decisions to be made, our work would be automated and is automated. So that, therefore, you're going to solve problems. And here's what I discovered, because I've done courses on problem solving and decision making for IBM all over the country, is that your ability to solve problems and make decisions is really the critical ability for success, advancement, and high income. When you look at people who start off in their first job with no earning ability with a large company, and 20 years later they're the president of that company, first of all they climbed up the ladder of success, but they developed the ability to solve problems at their level. And what Henry Kissinger said was the only thing you get for solving problems is bigger problems to solve. But bigger problems come with more responsibility, more authority. A factory is losing money, they send you out there to save the factory, save the jobs of 5,000 people, and you go in and you say, what are the problems that we're having in this factory that's keeping down our productivity or affecting our quality and so on? And they send out the best problem solvers. All my life I've met people who have started at the bottom and who are now top executives in major international corporations. And they say the reason they got here was because they developed an ability to solve the problems at their level. So I could talk about this all day, and I do. I'll just give you one thought, and this is so simple, it's embarrassing, is how do you become a great problem solver? And the answer is you focus on the solution rather than the problem. You think intensely about solutions all the time. Now what is it that average people, the bottom 80% of people, think about when a problem arises? The answer is who did it and who's to blame? They are focused on the past and the problem. What's the problem and who's to blame? What is it that top people do? They say, you cannot change a past event. This problem has occurred, so now it is a reality. So the only question now is, what do we do about it? How do we solve it? What is our next action? And so when you constantly think in terms of solutions, you become more and more valuable. And the more you think in terms of solutions to any problem in your life, the more you come up with solutions, the more creative you become. You become smarter and brighter. And when you are solving problems and discussing different choices and alternatives, you become more positive you become more powerful, you become more influential because, and eventually people say, you have got a problem, take it to him, take it to her because they're really good at solving problems. And your mind is in problem solving mode all the time. It's like it's clicked on and running all, it is all the time. And so you start throwing problems in the top of your hopper and the solutions are coming out all the time because you think about solutions, not blame. When you think about blame, it shuts down your brain. When you think about blame, who's to blame for the problem, it shuts down your creativity. It makes you ne negative, it makes you angry, and it makes you a negative influence on others. But when you think about solutions, you become the most important person in the room. So think about solutions. Now, here's a great exercise. Ask yourself, what is the biggest problem that I'm facing in my life today? Now, what is it that most people do is they can identify the problem. You all know what it is. Usually, the biggest problem in your life comes with hair on top. Uh, 
Well, we all know what the biggest problem is. Sometimes it's a business problem and so on. So then the next question is, what's the solution? What are all the possible solutions? And here's what they found is that the more solutions you can think of, I could do this, I could do that, I could do this, I could do that, the more likely it is you'll come up with a great solution. And so just start thinking in terms of solutions. I have the problem, but what's the great challenge with most people is they're passive. They have the problem and they accept it. Oh, I've got this problem. It's like standing in the rain, not here, of course, but, or standing in the sun and complaining about the weather. Uh, and the fact is that, to act, that, that, that proactive people like yourself, they say, this is a problem. It's an obstacle. It's causing me unhappiness or frustration. And by gum, I'm going to solve this problem. And they just start to think, well, how can we do it? And they ask other people, and they read, and they research. I remember a wonderful, wonderful story. This man took his little girl, six, seven years old, to the doctor, and she was sickly. And he and his wife took her to the doctor, and the doctor could not figure out what was wrong with her. He took her from doctor to doctor to doctor, and finally, he took her to a doctor, and the doctor did a special set of tests and came up and said, I'm sorry to tell you, but she's got a fatal illness, a terminal illness. She's got this special disease that very, very few people have, one in a million, and there's no cure. And so she's going to die within six to nine months. So you should make her as comfortable as possible. Well, these parents were really passionately concerned about their little girl. And so he went on the internet. This was just a few years ago. And he started doing research on this illness. He found that there were other people all over the world who had this illness, had it in their family. But as he found, he found that there was a professor at the University of Western Australia in Australia who had researched this for 10, 15 years and found a diagnosis. And the professor's name was Lorenzo. And he'd come up with an oil that you could take or you could put on the skin that would actually eventually solve this illness. And so they made a movie with Nick Nolte called Lorenzo's Oil. You remember the movie. And it was all about this story about this father would not give up finding a solution. He looked all over the world and he finally found someone who had found the cure and saved his daughter's life. The best doctors in the United States had told him to go home and make her comfortable because she's going to die and there's nothing you could do. But no damn way for this guy. He just went at it like a, like a, like a bulldog until he found a solution. I love that story because that's the story of the people here in this room is when you have a problem, you say, oh, I'm not going to be passive about this problem. Sales are down, profits are down, competition is tremendous, regulations are changing, and so on. I'm going to find a solution. I will find a solution. And I've worked with some of the most successful people in the world, some of the richest people in the world, and they all have that attitude. Is a problem is just something to be solved. It's an obstacle, it's something to go over or under or around, is they just expect that life is going to be full of obstacles and difficulties, and by gum, they will find a solution. So solving problems and making decisions is the, one of the seven most important things you do. Number four is, is to set priorities and determine key tasks. This, in all the time management work that I've done, and all the books I've written, and millions of people I've influenced, all of time management comes down to your ability to choose priorities, to select one thing and do that only that one thing until it's complete. And so setting priorities, and there's a whole series of techniques that you can do, but my favorite question of all in time management is to ask every minute of every hour, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? What is the most valuable use of my time right now? When you start work in the morning, if your entire income and all your hopes and dreams for yourself and your family and your future are determined by the revenues that you generate by your income, then the most valuable use of your time is to create value and generate revenues. And don't do anything but that. Don't do anything that is a secondary use of your time because whatever you do repeatedly over and over again becomes a habit. And pretty soon you develop the habit of doing small, unimportant things. And then you can't break the habit. It traps you. Every time you go to work, it's like the ball on the string. You just come boom and you start doing little irrelevant things. Soon the whole day is gone and you haven't achieved anything. So the key is to set priorities and focus on your most important priority. Focus, focus. The fifth characteristic of leaders is the ability to concentrate and focus on the most important thing you can do and to stay with it until it's 100% complete. 
Now, in life, what are we paid for? We're paid for results. But results mean task completion. So all of success in business is completing tasks, is complete the task, finish the task, get the task 100% done. The difference between winners and losers is they all work hard, but losers, the bottom 80%, don't complete their tasks. Is they work on the task and the task goes on and they get distracted or they procrastinate or the task takes much too long to complete. But what you and I are evaluated on is task completion, is finishing the job, getting the damn job completed. Now, when I was introduced, they said I've written 45 books. I'm happy to say that statistics about a year old, I've written 65 books. Was that too quick for you? No, it's about five years old. I write four books a year. This year, I publish eight books. And most professional writers, and I don't consider myself to be a writer, you don't see that anywhere in my biography. You know, I've written books, but I don't say writer. Um, I just write books because I, ha I, I have great ideas, practical ideas that I think people can use to be more effective. So I come up with the idea and I write it into a book. But because I've done so many thousands of hours of research, I can write almost every book, starting with a clean sheet of paper. I can write a 300-page book without no reference to notes on, a, on 65 different subjects. And they're loaded, as you know, with content. They're just loaded with great ideas, hundreds of great ideas on a particular subject. Anyway, people say, well, how can you write so many books? A professional writer writes one book every two or three years. And the answer is because I finish. I set it as a goal, I make a plan, I start work, and I finish the book. I complete the damn book. Do you know how many writers or would-be writers are out there who have books in their minds or books on paper and they never write the book? My good friend that I traveled with when I was, uh, when I was 20 years old, we talked about writing books at that time and he worked on his book until the age of 60. He worked for more than 35 years on his book and he never completed it. He just kept working. Meanwhile, I was writing four books a year, boom, 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 boom. And they've sold millions and millions of copies in almost every major language. Not because I'm any great genius, it's because I start and I finish. And the most incredible thing about task completion is that whenever you complete a task, it gives you a burst of endorphin. It makes you happy, it makes you feel powerful, it energizes you, it makes you feel strong. So what they have found is that any completed task is a source of self-esteem and self-confidence. It makes you feel like a winner. So if you have a series of tasks to do, and let's say you have 10 tasks, and this is the least important, and this is the most important, the bigger the task that you complete, the greater the feeling of personal power and self-esteem you have, the more you feel like a winner. And so if you can develop the habit of starting and completing tasks, you feel fabulous about yourself all the time. Your self-confidence goes through the roof, because you know, you know you can do anything that you put your mind to, because you've proven it to yourself. It's not that you hope you can complete important tasks. You've done it, and you do it regularly. Nothing will, will move you ahead faster than developing a reputation for starting and completing important tasks. They interviewed uh, several hundred CEOs of major corporations at a convention in New York a few years ago, and they asked them, what would most help a person in your company, a younger person, to move ahead rapidly, to get paid more and promoted faster in your company. 85% of them had the same answer. The ability to choose their most important task and then to get the task done quickly and well. And that has been corroborated by a thousand surveys. Is the most valuable people in my company are people who set priorities and work on really important things with big potential consequences for my company and then they do them quickly and well. Quickly and well. They do the job fast and they do it well and get it back to me. I learned this when I was a young person and it transformed my life. It's from then on, I just literally was like a fanatic. Every job my boss gave me, I did it quickly and well, quickly and well. I'd stay up all night, I would work weekends, I would work hours to complete tasks well, well in advance of when they were required. And it was, had the most incredible effect on my career. All you do is get a reputation for doing things quickly and well. And what happens is you set up the law of attraction, more and more and bigger and bigger and more important tasks are attracted into your life that you do quickly and well. Number, um, number six is to be a role model. 
And this is one of the most important qualities of leadership. When Tom Peters wrote his book, In Search of Excellence, he said this is perhaps the most important of all, is to be the kind of person that other people admire, is to set high standards for yourself, and then always live up to those standards. If you want people in your company to dress well, dress well yourself. If you want them to be punctual, be punctual for every meeting. If you want them to do their work quickly and well, do your work quickly and well. If you want them to treat each other nicely, treat everybody nicely. In other words, you at the top set the tone for everybody below you. Everybody in the company looks at the boss and does what the boss is doing. And the boss sets the tone and, se and determines the morale of the organization. So one of my favorite questions, which I pass on to you, is this. Is what kind of a company would my company be if everybody in it was just like me? What kind of a company would your company be if everybody in it did exactly what you did all day, every day? Would it be a better, would it be a better company? Or, or, or would there, is there room for improvement? And, 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 and the, the fact is, there's room for improvement. And, and if you're honest with yourself, you say, well, I could be a bit more punctual or a bit better prepared for meetings, or I could uh, uh, focus on um, revenue generation tasks, or I could be nicer to people or listen. I mean, there's a, once you ask this question, you set really high standards for yourself, and you always look for ways to be a better boss. And you'll find the very best companies have the best bosses, the best leaders. And they're the leaders that everybody admires and looks up to and respects because of the way they work and the way they treat other people. So keep setting high standards for yourself. And they say the superior, per the, the, the average person compares themselves with others. And the superior person compares themselves with what they are capable of being, with their actual, their true potential. Number seven key is to perform and get results. Coming back to our old friend, results. In the final analysis, all your hopes and dreams and all your income and all your future and the size of the house you live in and the car you drive and the vacations you take will be determined by the results that you get. And your job is to dedicate your working life to getting more and more and better and better results. And so perform and get results. And as I reverse, going right back to what Drucker said, the leader asks, what results are expected of me? And of all those results, what are the most important results? And then what you do is you pick the most important result of all, and then you focus and concentrate on that one result. And you work day and night, and you work with total dedication to accomplish that one result until you make a habit of starting and completing and achieving your most important results. And that will do more to help you in your business in terms of financial and personal results than anything else you can do. But it will also do more to affect you psychologically and emotionally. It will raise your self-esteem and self-confidence. They say confidence comes from accomplishing. Confidence doesn't come from attending motivational seminars. Confidence comes from actually doing good work and seeing that you've done good work and having people say, that's good work. <laughs> wow, you feel good about that. And you're internally motivated and driven to do it again and to repeat the process because you're getting positive responses whenever you do good work and whenever you complete your task. Now, two more things I have to finish with you. Those are the seven. The number one quality for success in business, according to the study of the presidents of the Fortune 500, of the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies in America, is unbridled optimism. These people are so positive, they should be rested and held in padded cells. They are so positive about the future of their business that no matter what happens, they just overwhelm every difficulty. It, does never, it never occurs to them that they will not be successful. They will just be successful in a different way. Now, how do you become an optimist? Well, optimism is like, is, is like mental fitness. Just like if you want to be physically fit, you um, get, work out physically with your body. If you want to be mentally fit, you exercise your mind. So there's four things that you can do for the rest of your life to be a really positive person. Number one is to think and talk about your goals and how to achieve them, is when you're thinking and talking about your most important goals, both business and personal, and you're thinking of the actions that you can take to achieve those goals, and you're actually taking those steps, your sense of optimism goes up dramatically. Number two is to look for the good in every situation. One of the facts is that you're going to have nothing but problems and difficulties and obstacles all your life. That goes with the nature of being in business. The only question is, how do you respond to them? And the answer is always look for something good. 
This, by the way, is a discovery made in interviewing thousands of the most successful people, is they make it a habit. Whenever something goes wrong, they say, well, that's good. And then find out something good about it. And there's always something good. No matter how bad the situation is, there's always something good that comes from it. The third way to become an optimist is to seek the valuable lesson in every setback or difficulty. This is the most important, perhaps, of all, is that you can focus on the problem and the loss, or you can focus on the lesson and what you can learn to be better next time. And whichever one you focus on determines whether you're positive or negative. If you are thinking about your goals, you're always positive. If you're looking for the good, you're always positive. If you're looking into your biggest problem today for the lessons you can learn from that problem, you'll always be positive. And the fourth key to optimism is to continue to learn and grow. Continue to learn new things that can help you to achieve your most important goals. And then, of course, take action. But you'll find that leaders are learners. They're constantly learning new things. And whenever you learn something new that can help you, it makes you happy. It makes you positive. It releases endorphins in your brain.